So today I'm going to talk you through ABG interpretation. ABGs are a brilliant way of increasing your understanding of what's going on with the patient's physiology. They give you answers really quickly in an emergency. You can check gas exchange, acid-base balance, and electrolytes without having to wait for laboratory tests. ABGs aren't a benign intervention though. They're not something that should be done on a whim. Take it from someone who's had a few. They hurt. They hurt a lot more than a venous sample. <laughs> <laughs> Respiratory patients, who maybe are frequent attenders to hospital, will be fully aware of this, and may put up a bit of resistance to getting another ABG, or may have had local anaesthetic for them in the past. So make sure you've discussed the need for an ABG with an appropriate senior, and give a thorough explanation to the patient as to why they need one. If you've got a patient who is likely to need a few ABGs every day, sometimes an arterial line is a kind thing to do. As a couple of concepts, I think it would be useful to go over first, and then we'll break down how to interpret an ABG in detail. First up is pH. pH is a logarithmic scale, which is not particularly important to know about in detail, but what is important to know is that it is inversely proportional to the concentration of hydrogen ions. Hydrogen ion concentration goes up, pH goes down. The body's pH is somewhere between 7.35 and 7.45, and the mechanisms that control this are extensive, but very strict. So you have to be quite unwell for this to be altered. The main acidic things we need to think about are those hydrogen ions, which are made in most of the body and can be excreted by the kidney. And then CO2, which we adjust by how much we breathe. The main extracellular buffer of these acids is bicarbonate. Right, now we can introduce a couple of other concepts based upon how these change. If, for some reason, we produce too many hydrogen ions and the buffers can't keep up with it, then pH falls and we get a metabolic acidosis. The cause of the acidosis is due to an acid-producing reaction somewhere within the body. If, for some reason, we stop being able to excrete CO2 as well as we should be able to, and its levels build up in the blood, this creates a respiratory acidosis. The cause of the acidosis is due to a ventilation issue. Don't forget, we can also create alkalosis with the opposites of these situations. For example, hyperventilation will blow off too much CO2, lowering your blood's acid content and thus increasing your pH, giving you a respiratory alkalosis. But this can be pathological or actually useful. The next concept I want to go through is compensation. Your body doesn't like having an abnormal pH, and so these respiratory and metabolic systems can help each other out to normalize the pH if given time. For example, a COPD patient who doesn't ventilate very well and has a chronically raised CO2 their kidneys will produce more bicarbonate in order to balance out that acidic CO2 and get the acid-base balance back on an even keel. Alternatively, if someone has a metabolic acidosis, say due to DKA, sepsis or organ failure, they will naturally increase the rate and depth of their breathing to blow off that CO2 and try and raise the pH back to normal. You can imagine that changing breathing is a lot quicker than changing kidneys. We can all adjust our CO2 quite quickly by hyperventilating. It's the low CO2 that gives you that dizzy feeling and breathing into a paper bag means you inhale more CO2 and less O2, and so counteracts this. But if the body has had time to balance out the acid-base balance using metabolic compensation due to a respiratory issue, if the pH is normal but the CO2 is raised, this patient has had issues for at least a few days. Right, let's break down an ABG as to how we'd suggest you look at it. But first, and most importantly, make sure you're interpreting this result in the context of the patient that's in front of you. Different results may mean different things in different clinical contexts, and EBG is extra info to guide you in these situations. First, look at the PaO2, the partial pressure of oxygen in the blood. Partial pressure of air at sea level is 100 kilopascals. Air is 21% oxygen, which can be referred to as the fraction of inspired oxygen, or FiO2. Normal PaO2 is somewhere in the region of 10 to 14 kilopascals on air. You'll see these normal values do vary a bit though, depending on which machine your hospital has. A good rule of thumb to remember is that normal PaO2 is FiO2 minus 10, which makes sense, doesn't it? FiO2 of air is 21, as we said, 21 minus 10 equals 11. That's between 10 and 14. However, what if your patient is not breathing room air? If they're on oxygen, look at what they're on, how many liters per minute of oxygen are going through this, and then look up the estimated FiO2 for that delivery device. 
unless it's a Venturi mask, in which case it will say the percentage on it, assuming it's being used right. 2 litre nasal cannula is about 28% FiO2, a non rebreather mask on 15 litres per minute is around 90% oxygen. The FiO2 minus 10 rule still applies. If your patient is on 90% oxygen and only has a PaO2 of 10, that's low. That's really low. The PaO2 result on ABG is useless if you don't record the oxygen the patient is on. Most machines will allow you to enter this, but if you forget, make sure you write it on the printout that goes in the paper notes or document it on the computer when you input the result. Next, let's look at pH. We've touched on this already. Normal is 7.35 to 7.45. Are they acidotic or alkalotic? We need to work out what may be causing this derangement, and to do this, we'll look at PaCO2 and bicarbonate. PaCO2. Normal is somewhere around 4.5 to 6 kilopascals. Look if this is high, normal, or low. There's a few small points about CO2 and O2 to note as well. Type 1 respiratory failure is a low PO2 and normal or low PCO2. The body can't get enough oxygen, but it can still excrete CO2. This takes less fully functioning lung capacity to do. Causes of this include pulmonary edema or pneumonia or most asthma attacks. Type 2 respiratory failure is a normal or low PO2 and high PCO2. The body can't get rid of CO2 now as well. This most commonly occurs in patients with COPD. It can occur in severe asthma attacks when the patient tires and doesn't have enough energy to ventilate anymore. But wear an asthmatic with type 2 respiratory failure. They're really big sick. Bicarbonate. Normal is 22 to 26 millimoles per litre. Look at whether this is high, normal or low. Right, this is enough to work out if your acid-based disturbance is of respiratory or metabolic origins. A metabolic acidosis has a low pH, low bicarbonate, and normal PaCO2. A metabolic alkalosis has a high pH, high bicarbonate, and normal PaCO2. A respiratory acidosis has a low pH, normal bicarbonate, and a high PaCO2. A respiratory alkalosis has a high pH, normal bicarbonate, and low PaCO2. <sighs> I wish that was it. But there's also that concept of compensation to throw in there. I'll only mention acidosis here, as these are the commonest culprits to be aware of, but you can work out their alkalosis counterparts. A metabolic acidosis with respiratory compensation has a low or normal pH, low bicarbonate, and low PaCO2. The body is ventilating more and blowing off more CO2. This can occur relatively quickly, as we said. A respiratory acidosis with metabolic compensation has a low or normal pH, high bicarbonate, and high PaCO2. The body is producing more bicarbonate in order to counteract that raised PaCO2. This is usually seen more in the chronic CO2 retainers in the respiratory disease population. Remember that compensation can be complete or partial. The body might manage to compensate only so far but not completely. It's good but it's not superhuman. Disturbances can also be mixed. Sometimes both the metabolic and respiratory sides are wrong in really sick people. Let's mention base excess next. This is another marker of acidosis or alkalosis. How much strong acid would have to be added or taken away from the blood in order to return the pH to normal, 7.4? It's related to the metabolic side of this rather than the respiratory, and normal range is minus 2 to plus 2, i.e. lower than minus 2 is a metabolic acidosis, and higher than plus 2 is a metabolic alkalosis. There are a few other things to talk about on an ABG. Lactate, this is a byproduct of anaerobic respiration, and is a good indicator of poor tissue perfusion. Lactate is acidic, so a raised lactate will drive a metabolic acidosis. Glucose. Don't ever forget it. This is useful for your DKA patients especially. Hemoglobin. This isn't always the most accurate measurement, but gives you a rough guide. Lab samples tend to be better, but it's good to know the ballpark. Electrolytes. These are accurate, and a good way of quickly knowing, say, someone's sodium or potassium if they've been off and you've been treating them. However, remember you can get these off a of venous gas, if these are all you're looking for. So an electrolyte, hemoglobin, or lactate check is not an indicator for an arterial sample. As usually, a carbon monoxide and a met hemoglobin result on an ABG2. These are rarely deranged. However, it's worth having an ever so quick look to see if the results are within the normal reference ranges. Right, we've talked through everything now. So to summarize, one, what is the patient you've got in front of you? What results are you expecting here? Are they off from a respiratory or metabolic perspective clinically? and check what fraction of inspired oxygen they're receiving if they're not breathing air. Two, 
what is the PO2? 3. What is the pH? Acidic or alkalotic? 4. What is the PCO2? 5. What is the bicarbonate or base excess? 6. Are they compensating? Are both PCO2 and bicarbonate off? Which one is compensating for which? Clinical correlation required here. 7. What are the other values? Is there anything else you need to check? This is a lot. We know it's a lot. And essentially, it takes practice. Look at all the ABGs you can and try and interpret them. As with all things, full disclosure, there's more to this. Anion gaps in metabolic acidosis is not something we've covered here. That's definitely the next level. Take your time to fully understand this and then come back to things like anion gaps in the due course. I hope this was useful for you and please like, subscribe and share this video with your friends and colleagues if so.